We're going to be merging these two passages of Scripture together here this morning because what is written by, for us by the evangelist Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 21 refers back to Zechariah chapter 9. In verse 4, we have this word that captures the essence of the narrative. He says that this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying. Matthew recorded these words because he wanted the people to see the connection between what was happening on the streets of Jerusalem in that day and the prophetic utterance that was given some 400 years prior to this time by a prophet that was speaking on a totally different subject in a way because he was speaking to the exiles that had returned. And Matthew now is saying, listen, what God prophesied 400 years ago is taking place right now, giving credence to the fact that this was the Messiah. This is who Zechariah the prophet spoke of. Rejoice, O Zion, the daughter of Zion, your king comes unto thee. And these things that were written, and all that, that Matthew records, all this was done, that it would be fulfilled by that which was spoken. That which was spoken. What God said then came to fruition and completion in Matthew's gospel on this day that we describe as the triumphal entry when Jesus offers himself as the Messiah, as the King. And what was fulfilled was the fact that his mode of transportation, the way that he would come, as, as Zechariah records it for us, he is just having salvation lowly, riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. All this came from, uh, and from Zechariah, and here we are in that day. There are some great lessons that we can learn from this. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning rather than piece together and, and make an application of the, of, of the individual events that took place on the streets, the men going for the donkey and Jesus riding and the throwing down of the clothes, etc. I want to refer us back to this time in Zechariah's writing and see the significance of the, why, why Matthew made it the point to say that all this took place that it might be fulfilled by that which was spoken, because what he wanted them to understand is God's word is meant to be trusted. God's word is meant to be believed in, and that what he said in the past will happen. What he's saying now of those things that are yet to take place will transpire. They will come to fruition. So we're going to take a historical journey. We're going to visit with Daniel and his prophecy. We're going to Look at a, a period of time when Zechariah was speaking to the exiled people beside Haggai. And we're going to follow Alexander the Great of all people in a biblical narrative. Alexander the Great, what does he have to do with this? And then we'll look at Zechariah's writings as he moves us forward to that which is yet to take place. So let's go to Zechariah chapter 9. And in this chapter, I divided it into three parts because that is the way that Zechariah gives it to us. The first is the protection of Israel and Jerusalem against their enemy. The first is how he prophesies in verses nine, chapter 9, 1 to 8. Zechariah prophesies that Israel will be protected from any future invasion that is going to take place. The second is the presentation of the Messiah, chapter 9 and verse 9, which we read as our main text this morning. The third division is the prophecy of the forthcoming kingdom, the prophecy of the forthcoming kingdom. So you have the protection of the nation, the presentation of the Messiah, and the prophecy of the kingdom. These are the three divisions that we find there. And as we look at this, we're, we're going to ask, us, ask ourselves a so now what question. 
And as we go along through this, these different texts this morning, we, it, it's a historical sermon, to be sure. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves the question, this question, what will I do with the evidence of prophecy? What will you do with the evidence of prophecy that is given to us in these passages of Scripture? And what are the applications that we must make upon our own heart? So we look at the passage, knowing these three divisions, protection of the nation, the presentation of the Messiah, and the prophecy or the promise of the future kingdom. Those are all prophetic utterances, two of which have come to pass, and the third remains. In the meanwhile, we as a people during the church age, in this auditory this morning, what will you do with these words what will you do with God's fulfillment of promise and what, what yet is yet to take place? What should be our response? What is it that God expects of us in light of this revelation of Scripture this morning? Well, concerning the protection of Jerusalem, when we read these first eight verses, it appears to be just meaningless information. Uh, some of the cities that are mentioned here no longer exist. Their names have been changed. But the cities mentioned in verses 9... Uh, verses 1 through 8 of chapter 9 are all coastal cities to the east of Israel. It was a land that uh, in the very beginning as they would conquer that promised land was theirs, the, the Gaza Strip, the coastal lines of Titan and Syria and all of these. And they were cities of wealth and power. They were owned by the Medo-Persian Empire. And so uh, as Zechariah is writing, he's writing about uh, a period of time that is yet to take place from the day of his writing. Do you remember when we were in the book of Ezra? The people returned from the Babylonian captivity, several thousand strong, and Ezra brings a huge contingent of people, and they begin to rebuild the temple. Some years later, approximately 14 years later, they lost interest in the whole project and began to put more time and money into their own houses. God dispatches two prophets to speak to the people. Haggai was one, Zechariah was the other. In the first eight chapters of Zechariah's book, he focuses and gives the visions of different things, the priest, the candlestick, etc. And all of that would have an immediate application to the people then, and Zechariah's time, which he preached somewhere around 500 B.C. Also, Haggai is telling the people about their cedar houses and that God would be with them and was there to restore the nation and then restore the temple. Later on, Nehemiah would come in and then rebuild the city walls. So as Zechariah is giving his sermon series in the first eight chapters, we get to chapter 9, and we begin to make a departure. He moves from uh, the events that are happening then in the new found city being rebuilt and the temple being rebuilt, and he moves them forward with upcoming events. And these upcoming events would agree with what Daniel would have to say in Daniel chapter 8. Because in Daniel chapter 8, if you'll turn to that in uh, January chapter 8, as he prophesied to, uh, during the reign of King Belshazzar, and because the king had a vision, those things which he, uh, uh, in the third year, the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto Daniel, which appeared to me at the first. And Daniel is going to unfold this vision. When we get to verse 5, of chapter 8, you read these words. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and stumped on him, 
and there was none that could be delivered out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And what Daniel is telling us is that in the period of history, uh, there is going to be a great transformation of political world powers. During the time of the Babylonian uh, captivity, it was Babylon and that were under the, the uh, they had ruled during that 70 years. Toward the end of that 70 years, there would be then uh, what would be known as the Medo-Persian Empire. And so we have what King Darius would enter into the scene and send forth a decree that the city walls were to be rebuilt. And so Daniel, in his prophecy, sees this ram with two horns. The two horns are the Medes and the Persians, which come together as the great ram, two great world powers forming one that ruled that part of the hemisphere for the long period of time. And they were almost uh, undefeatable. There were attempts to try and bring them down with military effort, and they failed. But then Daniel says that there was a he-goat that had one horn between his eyes. This he-goat would meet the ram, Medes and the Persians, at a river. And the Medes and Persian Empire, Darius the king, would put forth all of his military might and power against the he-goat with one horn. Historically, from secular history and biblical history, that would have been Alexander the Great. And from about 334 to approximately uh, 323, Alexander the Great, in 11 years, would come in from the West and virtually annihilate the known Medo-Persian Empire. That decisive battle, which was the first battle that Alexander the Great would fight against King Darius and the Medes and the Persians, was such a swift victory that the Persian army would flee, and Alexander the Great's army would follow them and had so disbanded them that they would never recuperate again. And so from there on, he would sweep eastward and then south along the coastline and then finally find his way down to Egypt, another massive world power. Egypt would just lay down and surrender. It's interesting that part of the way the historians would tell us that Alexander the Great was able to have such success was his military strategy and also the way that he would enter into these. He was a firm believer in the Homeric uh, poems and the stories of Homer and where uh, men were made to be like gods. And so he envisioned himself to be the son of the gods of Homer's poetry. And this would fit well with the uh, uh, mythology of the Medes and the Persians. And so as he would present himself and would resurrect some of their gods his, in, in story form and bring him, set himself forth as either that god or the son of those gods. And the people would buy it. By the time he got down to Egypt, uh, uh, Amun-Ra, well, the, the sun god, uh, by that time, Alexander the Great had gained so much strength that the, the Egyptians uh, uh, gave to him that title, and he assumed that title, that he was that new sun god. And so therefore, they're not going to fight against their own god. And he, he literally negotiated his way and took over Egypt. Well, what does that have to do with Jerusalem? Because during the time of from approximately 500 B.C. during the 300s, while Alexander the Great is coming through in this 11 year of warfare, Jerusalem is never visited. God says in Zechariah chapter 8 that he would put his eye upon the city. In verse 8, And I will encamp about my house because of the army, because of him that passes by, because of him that returns, and no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now I have seen with my eyes. Historically, and 
in uh, there is uh, Josephus records uh, an event where Alexander the Great went to visit one of the high priests of Jerusalem, and there's a little story that goes along the lines that uh, in this discourse and so forth, Alexander basically just leaves Jerusalem alone. Now, what is true is the fact that divine protection was there, and you would have to think, how would you feel in Jerusalem's time when there has been a a turnover of military power, world powers that owned everything from the east to the west. And now where are you going to fit into this if you're a little independent nation that has no mythological God, but only Jehovah? Alexander the Great literally walked away and left them to themselves. And so that takes care of the protection, the promise of the protection that they would receive. Prophesied by Zechariah, somewhere in the area of 500, in that neighborhood, the events all took place 200 years later. Alexander the Great sweeps through with uh, astonishing power and might and swiftness. That's why Daniel says that his feet never touch the earth. He depicts him as, as this goat that moved so fast and so powerful that it was as if he flew through the area and would destroy out all these nations and these cities. And then Jerusalem protected. So that is protection. But then Zechariah says this. Now he's speaking of another yet to take place future event. And that is our Matthew chapter 21 given to us in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. See, these are words of hope, words of encouragement, prophetic, not yet taken place. You're going to be protected. And the long-awaited Messiah that has been spoken of by previous prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, while you were in exile and while you were in captivity, here's another reminder. O daughter of Zion, rejoice. Behold, your king comes unto thee. He is just having salvation, riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. That wording is significant to the people because military kings would come in on great white stallions and they would march through their cities uh, bringing behind them all those that they had captured, displaying the captured armies and humiliating them publicly. And it is said that uh, of the Roman Empire, as the military generals come in, the festivity would last for three days in the display of their prisoners and the uh, smell of death that that would follow. But here we find this king coming on to his people your king is not going to come in the same way. So there would be immediately a radical difference between the two. And so Zechariah is prophesying, but notice the language that he uses. In his wording, he says, in his presentation, he comes, he is just, he is salvation, having salvation, lowly. His just is his righteousness, and he brings salvation. Now, in the immediate context, here is the new king that is going to have righteous judgment, and he's going to bring hope for the people. It also means that he is going to bring righteousness and justification. Turn, if you will, to Isaiah, to your left, Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah 53, in verse 11, as he pens out these words, we read this. And he shall see, God shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? He shall come in just, righteous, justifying many. So Zechariah is predicting for the people the saving work of Jesus Christ. He would bring justification by faith. He would bring righteousness to the people. And so the 
offer of the Messiah, the presentation of the Messiah, came to the streets of Jerusalem in chapter 21. And the characteristics of his Messiah, of this Jesus, was not his kingship necessarily. That was yet to follow. But his first priority was redemption. That he would offer to the people by the grace of God the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He is going to come in just and having salvation. I'm reminded, if we will, if you will, to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3 and verses uh, 23 and 24, he says, Therefore it is imputed unto him for righteousness. Not that it was written, or excuse me, that's chapter 4, it be chapter 3. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth, bringing salvation, to be the propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. The key words are the propitiation, that is, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, he would exchange judgment for mercy, and in this, we find that he is going to declare people just. I declare to this time his righteousness. Now, remember, I, Zechariah said, he will come in as just. He will come in as righteous, bringing salvation. I am going to declare his righteousness that he may be just and the justifier. Both fit in to the work of Jesus Christ. You see, the offer to us here this morning is to be able to receive this righteousness of Jesus Christ. Somehow or another, God had to be able to redeem uh, sinful humanity without violating the justice of his law. And in order to do that, Christ himself would have to satisfy the demands of the law, the demands of all the expectations of Scripture on the individual, that is to have a perfect obedience, he would also have to satisfy the demands of the law that in that violation, the wage of sin is death. And so Christ, in his perfect obedience, coming forth as just, his righteousness, he is going to be able to justify the sinful and still be right or just in himself. In other words, there's not going to be compromise on the part of God. That is the beauty of salvation. That sin had to be paid for by the sinner. Christ assumes upon himself, and God lays upon him all the sin of humanity, so that he who knew no sin becomes sin for us. That we might be, in exchange for, the right, be made the righteousness of God, in Jesus Christ. So as he walks through the streets, riding on this donkey, presenting himself as the one that is righteous, bringing salvation, he comes into this auditorium this morning, bringing the same offer. The presentation of the Messiah is the presentation of the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. The offer of the pardon, the forgiveness of sins to every individual that is in this auditorium to be able to receive the righteousness of Christ through faith in Jesus Christ, have sins pardoned, and to be made righteous. So what happens is you become righteous in the sight of God. Jesus Christ takes on your sin, which he paid for by his death, a horrific death on the cross. Zechariah's prophecy, here comes one that is lowly, bringing righteousness, bringing justice, bringing salvation. Here is one that is the righteous one, 
that is the one that is salvation. He did that by virtue of his dying on the cross, receiving the penalty for sin, and offering then his own righteousness because he atoned for that sin. He paid the price, offering it out as a free offering to all who will accept and believe. That's what makes a Christian. The protection of Israel from Jerusalem, prophesied by Zechariah, took place when Alexander the Great would sweep through the land, leaving Jerusalem unscathed, knocking down major world powers. That part of history passed. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, was new information to uh, Israel during the times of the rebuilding of the city. That came to fruition in Matthew 21, when Jesus came into the streets, Matthew simply saying this, God said it was going to happen. I'm telling you all this is recorded that it might be fulfilled by that which was spoken. He wants us to know that when God makes a prophetic promise in the word of God, that it is going to transpire, it is going to happen. He wanted the people to lift their eyes from the immediate context of Roman rule and trying to establish their own king. They didn't want any more of the Maccabean rebellion. He wanted them to receive this Messiah, and it was going to be theirs. And so here's the presentation of the Messiah, just and righteous. That is, in our eyes, that has taken place. But yet the offer of the just, righteous one remains today. That leaves us then with the prophecy of the kingdom. We go back to Zechariah chapter 9. And in the verses that follow, beginning of verse 10, I'm only going to read uh, a little bit at the beginning and then at the end. But beginning at verse 10, he says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. His dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from river even to the river, for uh, the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by thy blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will render double unto thee. And then he goes on to say what is about the yet to take place in what is known as the millennial kingdom. This chapter 9, just in these, he jettisons the mind 1,000 years period of time. It goes past the death of Christ, hidden then is the church time, the church age, during the time in which we live right now, exists between verse 9 and verse 10. We enjoy the benefits of the lowly one, the just one, and the righteousness of Christ. In the meanwhile, it is for us to understand that as Zechariah would speak to the people and say, lift up your eyes and look ahead. Here is a future promise that is yet to take place. It applies to us also as believers. Because when you go to the end of the chapter in verses 16 and 17, and the Lord their God shall save them in the day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon the land. How great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young man cheerful, and new wine the maids. This is all yet to take place. It's the speaking of that Davidic kingdom, that millennial rule and reign of Jesus Christ, when all things are restored and made new. That is yet to take place. So what do we do with this? Second Peter chapter 1 is where we close it out. Second Peter chapter 1, because Peter refers us to prophecy. He writes his book to the people in that day to give them two forms of prophetic evidence. The first is the fact that the sure word of prophecy, speaking of Jesus Christ, is sure and true and unchangeable. The second is that they are going to live in days in which all manner of deception and evil, where the grace of God is going to be turned into licentiousness and lasciviousness where men are going to abuse grace. There are going to be false teachers that are going to come across as pastors and teachers of the word. 
But in the meanwhile, at, in chapter 1, and beginning of verse 15, he says this, Moreover, I endeavor that ye also may, after my decease or my passing, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunning devised fables when we made unto you known the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, and there came such a voice unto him an excellent glory that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and we were with him in the holy mount. Now listen, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, wherefore you do well that you take heed. His admonition is in reference to prophetic words that you do well if you give attention to prophecy. We give attention to prophecy looking backwards because everything that God said, did. We have the biblical evidence. We have the secular evidence. We have the narratives of even such men as Josephus. We have the testimony. All the prophecies concerning Christ all came to fruition and were complete when Jesus walked upon the earth. Take heed. We do well that God's word is sure. That's why he calls it. We have a sure word of prophecy that it is the best thing that we can do is pay attention we do well when we take heed. So what do we want to do? Number one, we take heed that we do not separate current events from sovereign history. Do not separate current events from sovereign history. That is, the story of God in the history of mankind. We are at the most crucial time in the political career of the United States. And everybody offers some kind of hope. And it's very easy to become distracted. It's very easy to separate uh, the events of the, of the news and the elections and the politicians from uh, where does this have anything to do with God. And, we're, and there's a tendency to see that, yeah, we know God is at work, but we can't fit it together with what is happening now with the presidential hopefuls. We hear what they have to say, and, and we have our thoughts on these things, but we can very dangerously separate. Okay, we're just going to uh, dig in. We're going to be a church. We're going to pray and, and uh, live right the way we're supposed to and just face whatever comes. When we do that, we've separated sovereign history, the affairs, God in the affairs of humanity, God in the affairs of government. And when we separate it, we're going to be more frightened. So you see, Peter writes and says this, you do well that you take heed, as unto a light. He's saying that prophecy is like light in a dark place. Total absolute darkness will create a sense of, you know how we say the hair stands up on the back of your neck, and then there are these feelings that go across your body, inexplicable. And my, my time in a, an abandoned tunnel in Pennsylvania's abandoned turnpike, the tunnel was a mile and three quarters in length and it arched in the middle. There's a point in there that one mile behind you, light disappears because that 20 foot wide by 15 foot high arch literally is absorbed by the darkness. And looking ahead, there is nothing to see and the sensation. But moving forward, that little dot of light is light that we do well as in the light that shines in a dark place. We are in dark 
dark times. It's only going to get worse. And Peter's admonition to us and the lesson that we want to gain from this triumphal entry of Jesus Christ is the fact that these things were written that it might be fulfilled which was spoken. God wrote these things to build our confidence and our trust in the prophetic word of God that God never forgets his people. God will not forget the church. That all the events that transpire around us are a combination of the sinful responses of mankind and God working in the heart of the Washington, D.C. and world leaders. We may not fully understand how all this is going to play out. We not be, not be able to hang flesh upon these skeletal bones of political powers and what that's going to create in the end. But we do know this, that as, as Matthew said, I wrote it to show them that it was spoken and that it happened. Peter says this, that you do well, that we take heed to the light of prophecy, and that in the process of this taking heed, be careful not to dichotomize history and humanity from the sovereign work of God, that it all fits under God's plan for the nations, for the church, for our individual lives. Take heed the prophecy, keep it all as one unit, look at it as light in a dark place because only light then is your hope. Second, take heed that you do not reject the offer of righteousness. As the days get darker and the world becomes more sinful and as the special agenda groups and other political interests are forcing and foisting their preferences and laws upon the Christians and violating our own conscience and what we believe in and bringing our nation down, it continues to get darker. There is less hope of redemption and salvation for an individual that buys into this. Take heed with the light of prophecy. God said, I would send a redeemer. He did that. God said, the offer of the redeemer, Jesus Christ, is still here today. So take heed that you not sit here this morning and reject the offer of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the justification to be declared righteous by God on your behalf. Take heed that you do not reject that offer. And thirdly, in light of this passage, live and believe that Jesus will come again. Titus tells us that as we look forward to that hope and the return of Jesus Christ, and John writes the same words, that this hope with that is within us, that it will lead to purifying our lives. Take heed that we live and believe that Jesus will come again. Listen to what he says. Take heed unto the light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, a reference to Christ and his second return. So this morning when you leave, you want to leave with one of two thoughts. Number one, have I accepted the offer of the, of the king, his righteousness, his justification, that it could be yours through faith in Jesus Christ. The offer to be declared justified and righteous by God. Never to be revoked, never to be changed, Limited time offer. Limited time because there will be that day when the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and they, all those that remain will then be called up to be with the Lord, to ever to be with the Lord. The door is closed. Just as with Noah's ark, the door closed. Receive the offer today. As Christians, as Christians, let's keep it in perspective. I enjoy the news I read the articles, I listen to the politicians, I have my opinion. As we listen to all of this, it could be so discouraging. And when you hear of the lawsuits that are being brought against Christians and where new legislation has to be developed and put in 
as, as if it's a redundancy to protect the clergy, to protect the church from all manner of, of um, promiscuity because we, we refuse to become involved in it. All of this is darkness, 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 darkness. Keep it in perspective. Look to that prophetic light. Jesus will return. And these things are happening today that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Titus, by Timothy, by Paul, that men will become lovers of their own selves, rebellious, disobedient, haters of parents, taking the, right to the grace of God and turning it into lasciviousness, making grace a license to sin. All of these are prophetic predictions of the end times in which we live right now. So we have, we have a repeat story that if Matthew were to be writing and here today, he would say, and what you read in the Wall Street and what you read and hear on the news, this is to, these things are being said and written that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Paul and Peter and Titus, that it might be fulfilled. Those things that they said are happening. The completion of prophetic word. Look at the word of God, his promise and his prophetic statements as light in a dark place as the dawn arises and the stay, day star arise in your heart. Be saved and be certain on the word of God. Our Father, today, as we bring this sermon to closure and we look and we see that Matthew just simply wanted the people to understand that the word of God was true, irrevocable, and accurate to the very detail of the animal, the response of the people, how they would celebrate him on the street, the surrender of that donkey, and all of these things were written to show that it was spoken and that it happened. Now, we know that there are things that are yet to take place, and as we live in tumultuous times, times of darkness and fear. Lord, help it be that we live not by fear, but by faith. And that our lives are transformed from those that are lost, would come and receive the righteous judgment of Jesus Christ. And as believers, Father, we would invest our time into purity and godliness and holiness. You're coming again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.